And yeah, so here we are. And I would like to just go ahead with the typical program that we do here with SFDC folks, which is we would uh, go ahead and start with the refuges and precepts and then move on to a guided meditation and then maybe a minute or two stretch break before the Dhamma talk and Q&A at the end. So that's our plan for the day. We'll see how things go. And uh, Noam, would you go ahead and share the refuges and precepts on screen or should I share it from my screen? I was going to say, yeah, I can share, but I'm having a weird view from my computer. Something is weird about my Zoom, so maybe you should share. I don't know what's okay. going on. <laughs> Sorry oh. about that. I'm glad, okay. glad you have it available. Okay. I have it right here. I already brought it up. So let me just go ahead and open that. And there we are. Great. So these are the refuges. And just to say a word about this, many of you probably, maybe all of you already know that uh, we begin our uh, early, our, uh, yeah, teachings in early Buddhism typically begin with this, with uh, paying homage to the Buddha as the Blessed One, that's what Bhagavato means, and Arahato means one who is enlightened, one who has uh, realized the true nature of all things. And then Samma, Sambuddhasa means perfectly awakened one. And then below that, uh, three times of the uh, Namotasa, then we see the taking refuge. So gachami means literally I go to, I go to the Buddha as a refuge. I go to the Dhamma as a refuge. I go to the Sangha as a refuge, yeah. And then dutyampi means the second time and tatyampi means the third time. So really taking up the, both the historical Buddha and, and our intrinsic capacity for awakening as a place of sanity, as a place of inspiration in our lives. The Dhamma is something that both is a description of what's real and the, the things themselves, the, the, thing, the, the attributes of reality so to speak. Dhammas can be like objects or things within reality, as well as the actual teachings. Or sometimes translated as truth or the law, the Dhamma. And then the Sangha. So originally I referred to only the fully enlightened Arhants, and then it has now it has been expanded and uh, still in Theravada Buddhism, primarily used to refer to the monastic Sangha, folks who are ordained, folks of, of all genders who are ordained. Uh, and more broadly, you know, Sangha as our community of uh, good friends who also take refuge in these beautiful teachings, these helpful, liberative teachings. So what I'd like to do is just go ahead and chant it and you all can chant along rather than having a call and response. I think that that sort of allows for uh, people's familiarity or lack of familiarity with the Pali. So, uh, or if you want to just let it wash over you, that's also quite well. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa 
Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sanghang saranang gachami Dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami Dutiampi dhammang saranang gachami Dutiampi sanghang saranang gachami Chami Tatiampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Ti Saranagamana Nititang Okay, and then we have the five precepts. So these are the, the lay precepts as they were described by the Buddha, a really strong foundation for the aspiration uh, of non-harming, of being a, a positive presence in the world and, uh, and a safe presence for others that they might also find their... Um, their path to being positive, a positive presence, a wholesome presence. So please um, only take the precepts that you're actually going to keep. And um, if, even if you only take them for an hour, it's beneficial. But certainly the five lay precepts can also be taken up as a lifetime of practice. So we have them only in English here. So that's good. That's easy. Everybody uh, who would like to can follow along. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. So these are the five precepts, virtue or morality or ethics. Virtue is the basis for true happiness. Virtue is the basis for true wealth. Virtue is the basis for the path of leading to absolute peace. So may your virtue be strong, clear. Lovely, so we are ready then for a guided meditation. So what I'd like to do is lead us in a, a meditation on the six sense bases or the six sense fields. And so you can begin by taking your supportive meditation posture.
So finding your place of being supported by the earth, grounded. Part of the earth, supported by the earth. And allowing as much as possible the bones of the spine to line up. So that the head can rest at the top of the spine. Allowing that alignment, that steadiness to release the muscles of the shoulders and the neck. Softening and widening. Allowing room in the chest for this open hearted practice. Placing your hands wherever they feel relaxed. Maybe flat on top of the thighs. If you're feeling tension, you can relax the, the energy of the body to place the hands on the thighs. Or if you're feeling that post-lunch food coma, you could gather the hands together in the lower abdomen area, really bringing the energy of the body together. Right hand on top of left hand and the thumb tips gently touching. Allowing the eyes to close softly when they're ready. No need to rush it. So we're going to begin experiencing the six sense fields. We're going to start with the sensation of touch, specifically looking at touch in one of your feet. So noticing wherever the foot is resting, the sensation of touch. And just tuning into that sensation there. 
No need to strain because it's already happening. It's just a question of attuning to the sensation that's already there. Noticing whether it shifts over time. The sensation of touch in the foot. And now slowly moving up the body, moving the attention up the torso to come and examine the sensation of taste. Just observing the sensation of taste. How is it in this moment? Perhaps it's very subtle or very neutral. And if the mind moves away, just returning again to that embodied sensation of taste. Again, noticing whether it changes over time. Is the sensation shifting at all? And now shifting the attention to the sensation of smell. Again, no need to strain or stress. Just observing whatever sensation might be there. in the sense field of smell.
staying with that sensation of smell in this moment, noticing, observing. Bringing the mind back to the embodied sensation of smell. And now making another shift to the sensation of sight. Whether the eyes are closed or open, there's still some sensation, some stimulation that's happening. So gently, without straining the eyes, Just observing. The field of sight. How is it in the field of sight in this moment? What sensations are present? Remembering to come back to the body if you lose the thread.
And now another shift to the sense field of hearing. Really attuning to any sounds that are being received by the sense field of hearing. Noticing sounds arising and dissipating. Tuning in to the sense field of hearing. Observing whatever sensations are present within that field. Observing how they come and go. No need to reach out and grasp at sounds. They simply arrive in the sense field of hearing. And now finally shifting to the sixth sense field of mind. Thinking and perceiving. So opening up, right? Mind is not the brain. or contained anywhere in the body. But observing the mind as a sense field
all the other perceptions and thoughts arising within that field and dissipating. Observing the mind. How is the mind as a sense field in this moment? What activity or stillness might be present? No need to strain or push in any way. Just observing the sensations within the sense field of mind. How is the mind in this moment? And now having observed all six sense fields, you could choose the one that feels the most accessible. 
the one that feels the most easy to observe. Just stay with that for a while for the end of, until the end of this meditation.
And now in these last few minutes of the meditation, turning the awareness to the whole body at once. aware of the whole body in the meditation posture. Lovely. So now we're warmed up. (laughs) And now we're at the time in our program where I want to go ahead and offer a Dhamma reflection. And so I will begin again with the homage to the Buddha, because you can't do that enough, and pay my respect to our original teacher. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa 
Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So welcome again, everyone. My name is Aya Damadipa, and I am very happy to be joining you here today. And today I want to talk a little bit about uh, the topic of fear, actually. Topic of fear and what the Buddha offered us in terms of ways to meet that. And I want to start in particular by talking about, uh, you know, there's this phrase, this uh, phrase in English, uh, American slang or American idioms, where we say, where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And um, here in California and in much of the world, we are in the season of fire. We're beginning the season of fire. Again, and it's been an unusually dry year. It's been a year of very, very little rainfall. You notice that a lot up here in the mountains, usually in winter retreat, we'd have quite a bit more snow and rain than we did this year. And uh, some folks are probably experiencing this very hot weather. <laughs> Although, as Noam was mentioning, there in San Francisco, it's pretty moderate all the time, no matter how, how much heat we might be experiencing up here in the foothills of the Sierra. But there is this sense of, uh, of beginning the fire season and it, be, it being a dry period. And given how things went last year, when we had an unusually difficult fire season, a lot of fires and a lot of smoke. Um, you know, there's a sense perhaps of some foreboding or some dread or some concern about what might happen. So I just use this in, as an example. This may or may not be true about the place where you are living, but hopefully you can follow this uh, thread a bit and relate it to your own situation. So I want to unpack this, this uh, feeling, this, uh, this example, you know, so here we are, it's 2021, the, the, uh, in 2020, we had a situation in the summer where there was so much smoke that the skies were dark even in the middle of the day. Do people remember that? Maybe some folks remember that. It was actually in much of the media across the country, photographs of, uh, of how that was. And there was a lot of ash as well. And, and the, even when the skies cleared up enough that it wasn't dark, there was orange. We would wake up here at the Vihar and my, my uh, window faces to the east. So I would see the sunrise in these very orange skies. And so a lot of people at that time expressed a feeling of fear or a feeling of uneasiness, right? Feeling of, of uneasiness or anxiety or concern. And so if we look at that in the framework of the five khandhas, so the framework of the five khandhas is one of the ways in which the Buddha described a human life. It's a way, it's one of the ways, the frameworks that the Buddha gave for um, 
how to be present skillfully with our bodies and minds. So um, just to recap what they are. So we've been covering uh, different aspects of the Satipatthana and the five khandhas come up as dhammas in the fourth foundation of mindfulness. Among other places, there are actually, gosh, like over 200 uh, suttas about the khandhas discourses about the khandhas in the Samyutta Nikaya and the connected discourses as well. And so anyway, so they are uh, rupa, which is form, usually understood as the body and things that emanate from the body, like heat or tears or waste, sweat, so on. Uh, vedana, so vedana is a uh, feeling tone, right? Feeling tone. It's a like pre-verbal sense that a particular contact is pleasant, unpleasant, or neither of those two things. So either neutral or unable to discern something. That third category is a little, it's kind of in the middle between the two other valences. And then we have sanya perception. And perception is like identifying a thing as a thing. So, so you have a contact and you see an object, an object, the light of an uh bounces off a particular object and meets your eye and you see it and you think, oh, cat, that's, you know what it is. That's perception. Then uh, Sankara. So Sankara is one that is understood in various ways, but um, Buddhist scholar Venerable Analio makes the point that as far as we can see in the discourses, the Pali discourses, it really pretty much refers narrowly to volition, to choices and intention, rather than the whole bucket of all other mental phenomena. So just to choices and intention. And then finally, vinyana. So vinyana is consciousness. That's the fifth of the five khandhas, okay? So this feeling of uneasiness is a sanya, is a perception. It's a perception of a mental state, a mental quality. And, or fear, same, right? It's a perception of a mental quality or a mental state. And it's those, that perception is based on Vedana, is based on this pre-verbal, uh, sense that we have or feeling tone that we have about a contact. And in this case, it's about a contact of what? Of seeing or smelling smoke, right? Seeing a, a dark sky or smelling the smoke or seeing the soot, for example, feeling the soot on your skin, on your clothes, on your uh, furniture. So that Vedana is an unpleasant Vedana, right? It's an unpleasant feeling tone. And that's why the corresponding perception is something that we find, uh, that we identify as unpleasant, this uneasiness or this fear. So that's the mechanics, if you will, some of the mechanics of how that happens. And the Buddha described contact very clearly. He describes contact as the coming together of the consciousness with a sense field. So that's why we did the meditation on the sense field just a moment, the sense fields just a moment ago. So you could begin to tune into how, where those points of contact are, right? where those points of contact between the consciousness and the sense fields. And when those are happening, there's, when there's some object in the sense field, right? So when there's a sound that hits your ear and there's an awareness of the ear, of the ear as a field of, of sense, sensory perception, then that's contact. And there's so-called ear consciousness that happens. And so this feeling of uneasiness that comes out of this unpleasant Vedana, out of this unpleasant tone, underlying tone, makes sense, right? 
because the contact that's happening is actually inviting a response, right? Our most primitive sense, our most primitive um, mental response is one that knows that there's something wrong there, right? That negative feeling tone. When we see the dark skies in the middle of the day, So there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with how our minds are working or something wrong with our bodies. If we feel uneasiness at that kind of contact, right? Because there is something actually in the environment that is inviting a response. It's an unsafe condition in the environment. And interestingly, that's why we're, that's one of the reasons why we're built that way, right? To be able to detect unsafe situations in our environment and then respond. So what does it invite? It, it invites a sankara, right? A choice or an intentional response. When that perception of uneasiness comes up, it invites some kind of response, a volitional response. And so what are the things that we might have done last year when that was happening? So you might have uh, worn a mask, you know, there are certain kinds of masks that are particularly helpful for the particulate matter of ash. Or you might have just stayed indoors and kept your windows closed. Or you might have uh, an air filter of some sort or uh, turned on your air conditioning because that also has a filter in it or any number of other responses to the physical conditions that were present, right? As best you can, you can respond to the fear, the uneasiness by making intentional choices about the environment in which that perception and in which that feeling tone is coming up, right? So there are things that you can do, perhaps. But then there's also the, the issue of inviting a response to the fear itself or to the uneasiness itself. So taking steps to address the mental state of fear. And what might some of those be? What might some of those be? So one way to address fear is by attending to the body attending to the physical body and the body's way of expressing this fear that's coming up in the mind. So tuning into that mind-body connection and actually being conscious of it, being aware of it, maybe doing some kind of uh, physical activity that helps you become conscious of it like some qigong or some yoga, something that is responding to the nervous system, working with that conscious awareness and, and slowing down, right? And bringing some conscious movement in a slow, thoughtful way. So it really is actually also developing the mindfulness of body, returning to the mindfulness of body. And I'm going to say more about that in a minute, but other things you might do, you might do, you might have done uh, some journaling or some talking about it, some way of expressing in words 
what's happening with it. And why is this helpful? Well, one way that it's helpful is naming it, right? You're actually looking at the mental states that are present at the causes and conditions, getting clear about it. It's a form of investigation, really, this way of responding to fear. And actually, even that much, even that capacity to see the uneasiness, to see the fear that's present, to see the causes and conditions and the process nature of it, to see the physical reasons for it and the physical embodied expression of it, all of those things are helpful in and of themselves. You know, when I was a chaplain, this was one of the things that was always the most mysterious to me. So I would be doing spiritual care in the hospital and I would go into somebody's room and they would, you know, maybe be experiencing a lot of pain, for example. They were having, you know, sometimes there are situations where the doctors are having trouble helping people control their pain in their body or respond to the pain in the body. And, and just coming into the room and having the person express what was happening and then mirroring that, wow, it sounds like you're having a lot of pain. It sounds like you and the team are really struggling with how to respond to this. It sounds like it's really kind of overwhelming for you right now or whatever the thing is just meeting it with that kind of clarity is compassion already. Because it's acknowledging the reality of the human experience, of the lived experience. And oftentimes, just that much, you would see it, right? A person would sigh, oh, you know? Or they would start to cry. You know, and the Buddha actually interestingly says something like that in the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, in the first turning of the wheel, his very first, what, what early Buddhism understands to be the Buddha's first discourse. The Buddha says, There is the noble truth of suffering, of dukkha. So suffering is a shorthand for dukkha, right? And we could get more into what that means, what it is. But there is a noble truth of dukkha. And knowing that, seeing that, there was wisdom, there was light that arose in me. Even before it was perfected, because then he goes on to say, and dukkha is to be understood. And then dukkha was fully understood. And then he says again, until I fully understood dukkha, the cause of dukkha, the cessation of dukkha, and the path to end dukkha, I did not declare myself fully free. But even well before that, at the very beginning, just knowing that there is dukkha was a kind of light, was a kind of wisdom, was a kind of opening for him. And in the same way for ourselves, it's a growth on the path, I propose. It's a maturing on the path to be able to face our own dukkha gently and with as much clarity and steadiness as we can muster. Not that we need to force ourselves. I'm not suggesting that you should force yourself to face a pain that you find completely overwhelming or that you don't have the tools to face. But to the extent that you can, keep doing that. Keep facing the dukkha. Keep making the effort to understand the dukkha. That is, that is fundamental to the path. And then the sort of indirect response, one indirect response that we can take is karuna. So doing the meditation, so, so um, the four Brahma Viharas, the four uh, sort of sublime or divine abidings, 
and that has certainly been my experience of them, divine abidings of loving kindness, metta, loving kindness, karuna, which is compassion, right? Mudita, which is uh, uh, empathetic joy, or some people call it um, sympathetic joy, and upeka, equanimity, yeah? So karuna is the wish for our beings to be free from suffering, oneself and other beings, right? So karuna is also a kind of indirect way of responding to our fear and our un anxiety and, and uneasiness, right? It's a way of nourishing the heart and reminding ourselves of the intention for all beings to be safe, for all beings to be free from suffering as much as possible, and to abide in that knowing that there is suffering in the world. This is the real meaning of the, the one of the ways of understanding the true meaning of compassion is there is an, it's an acknowledgement as distinct from metta. So metta is wishing beings well, but karuna has this particular flavor of acknowledging that there is suffering and yet that we can meet it that we can meet it with intentionality and with our kindness of heart and our intention. And when we, when we bring that intention to life, that universal compassion to life in our hearts, then the world is changed because of the way that we are interacting with the world. So these are all ways that you might have responded last year. And I'm gonna to try to wrap it up here so that we have time for a few comments or questions at the end. But I just wanna contrast that with the foreboding that might be happening with this year. Because that in my mind is a different dynamic. So you have that same fearful, uneasy perception perhaps, and that uneasy perception is based again on a unpleasant Vedana. But that unpleasant Vedana is coming out of a different kind of contact. It's not coming out of a physical contact, it's coming out of a mental contact. And I can see Noam there pointing at his head. Yes, it's coming out of thoughts. It's not actually present in your environment, at least not yet, right? It's about thoughts meeting thoughts, thoughts sparking other thoughts. So it's a different form of contact. And so that we have to really be much more careful and discerning about that. Because I would suggest that contact, which is mind with mind, can be incredibly skillful and is actually tremendously uplifting and beneficial on the spiritual path. But it can also veer very off. It can be that we get very, very deeply entangled and out of touch with our environment and the reality of what's happening in our lives. So very, we have to be very much more discerning and more sensible about, okay, this is not inviting necessarily a sankara, a volitional response. This might be inviting just an investigation. Let's just look first. Let's just look and see what the situation actually is in the mind, in this contact, in the environment. What's real here? What's really happening? So can something be done? Or do we choose simply not to react to that? So maybe something can be done here at Aloka Vihara. We, are, we had to take out all of the gardens around the house. We were asked by our fire insurer to have a five foot distance between the house and any vegetation whatsoever. So with the help of many volunteers, we, have, we are shredding, we, are, we have torn out the gardens and the juniper and all kinds of stuff that was around the house and putting down gravel instead. Right, so there is one that that was a what was a skillful response to the actual situation of what's here and what we can do about it. But as regards the thoughts, you know, 
again, we have to be pretty discerning about this. Sometimes, oftentimes, just staying still with fear is the best thing to do. It seems difficult sometimes. It's, it requires a lot of discipline. But I will read you just a very short passage from the Buddha about this. He says, uh, this is from the Middle Link Discourses number 44, a discourse, discourse number, uh, sorry, not 44, number four. Majjhima Nikaya, number four. And it's called Fear and Dread, <laughs> actually. And he said this, he said, While I dwelt there in these horrifying abodes, such as the woodland shrines, the orchard shrines. So there were these places that he was scared of, literally the orchards and certain parts of the forest, the woods. He said, when I dwelt there, a wild animal would come up to me or a peacock would knock off a branch or the wind would rustle the leaves. And I thought, oh, what now if this is the fear and dread coming? And then I thought, why do I always dwell expecting fear and dread? What if I subdue that fear and dread while keeping the same posture that I am in when it comes upon me? While I walked, the fear and dread came upon me, and I neither stood nor sat nor laid down until I had subdued that fear. So he just kept walking. If fear was happening when he was walking, he just kept walking a little while to walk it off, so to speak. And he says, if fear came up when he was sitting, he didn't get up from sitting. He just stayed sitting for a while and he just tried to be still with his fear. And because of that, then mindfulness became established in him, right? That's what happens when we stay still. Then we can be mindful and we can be more present with the conditions that are actually in front of us. And again, it's a discipline. It's a discipline. It can be, it can be quite difficult. I actually did a recording called anxiety response, uh, an anxiety response meditation, which uses this principle of standing still and looking around and discerning about the environment. So if y'all are interested in that, you can go to my website and have a look at it. Um, it's very short. It's about a nine minute, I think it is. Could be 12. Sorry, I'm not sure. I don't remember. It was a while ago that I recorded this a few years ago. So, so we need to, we need to, to discern the mental state, be still with the mental state, be mindful of the mental state, and watch it, observe it, know that we have a choice about that. So I'm going to end now with reading you this beautiful poem by Wendell Berry, who also speaks about stillness in the face of fear. And then I'm going to open it up for questions and comments. So this is Wendell Berry's poem called The Peace of the Wild Things, which was a poem that came into my consciousness while I was doing hospice chaplaincy a number of years back, home hospice chaplaincy. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. Thank you for your attention, everyone. Thank you.
So I'm happy to uh, take about maybe five minutes of comments or questions or anything else that folks want to bring up. I think we can just uh, raise your blue hands or your physical hands either way. Yes, Charlie, Char Leslie. Yes, Char Charles Lee. Charles Lee. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, oh no, no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I had a question about uh, consciousness and 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 I guess sense contact. Does um, I guess does consciousness exist without the sense object? Um, is it just hanging out there waiting or mm -hmm. what is it doing or does it is it not there i don't know i'm kind of confused <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a good point so consciousness can be understood as a kind of vast receptive field of awareness and so is it just hanging out there in a sense in a sense, but the Buddha really talked about name and form and consciousness as informing each other or body and consciousness also informing each other. So it's, it's kind of co-arising, it's reliant on other conditions, right? It's reliant on other conditions, but it, consciousness as understood particularly in the five khandhas, so we're talking about vijnana specifically, is a kind of, a kind of that, a kind of open, receptive, um silent awareness it's not it's and this is actually one of the beautiful things about the khandas something that's very um kind of subtly embedded in that framework which is the buddha saying to us uh, the way that i sort of often relate to these lists that we get is okay look here look here at the body and then look here, look here at the feeling tone, look here at the perception, look here at the volitional, look here at the consciousness, right? So he's giving us these kinds of areas of focus, if you will. And so looking at it that way, if it's parsed out that way, you can see right away that the thinking mind is those other three parts right? The thinking mind that knows that something's not okay or is okay or I'm not sure, that's the Vedana part. And then the thinking mind that puts some words to that. And then the thinking mind that wants to do something about that, those are the, the other three. And then you have the body, but then you have consciousness. You have this other aspect. And the, and the Buddha said, when contact happens, so let's again, go back to like a sound. So you have a sound that meets your ear, your sense field is impacted, right? And this is why you don't need to go out and grasp the sound. The sound is entering the sense field and it's doing its work. And then if the consciousness is there, then those three coming together, that's the contact. And then he said, oh, and then there's an ear consciousness. There's a moment, an instant of ear consciousness. Not a, not a different thing, it's still the consciousness, but the consciousness gets like colored by that way that it hit that organ. And that, so a good example of this is like, if you look at a flower, the, the seeing of the flower is very different than if you tasted the flower, right? Or if you touch the flower, the consciousness, the way that consciousness is affected is different in each of those instances. Great. Thanks. That helps. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thanks for the question. Good question. So now we are at our finish time. So um, if folks are okay, right? Three o'clock. No, is that right? Yeah. So if folks are uh, ready, then I will go ahead and chant a very short blessing for you. Bawatu saba mangalang rakantu saba dewata 
Sababuddha nubhavena sada soti bhavan tute bhavatu sabha mangalang brakanti sabha devata sabha dhamma nubhavena sada soti bhavan tute Bhavatu sabha mangalang rakantu sabha devata sabha sangha nubhavena sada soti bhavantu te. By the power of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, may you ever be well. Thanks for hosting me. Good to see you all. <laughs>